So uh, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about cheap data to start with as opposed to big data because I've gotten tired of big data. Um, what I think is interesting is that as data becomes cheap, it becomes the sort of thing that can be generated outside the sorts of places that used to exclusively generate data. And so it's the cheapness of data that in many ways democratizes it, not the size of the data that's, that's disruptive. And so I'm going to try to give some examples of that. But uh, since whenever you speak after lunch, you have to be careful of the, the whole energy drop. So I'm going to go with baseball, which is an American sport mainly, but they do also play quite a bit of it here. Um, we used to judge right, the decision as to whether or not this guy was worth a multi-million dollar contract. Right? We would justify that decision, which is the epistemology, based on the opinions of an expert scout who went and looked at this guy play. Now, we've changed that. right? The epistemology of baseball has changed, and we now justify whether or not this guy should be paid a multi-million dollar salary by this formula. Right. So the availability of cheap baseball data has changed the epistemology, right, the justification for the belief that someone's going to be a good player, right, and it's moved to something that is far more statistical. And this is happening in sector after sector in our society, and it's really life sciences and health that are resisting it uh, more than many other parts of our society. Uh, I live in the US. I live in DC, actually. Um, I can tell you that surveillance has not avoided this math. Right? We've practiced that surveillance on the entire rest of the world because of the effectiveness of gathering large amounts of data and using statistical modeling on that data. But it's not happening in health and biology yet. And so recent attempts to open data, right? and I, I'm part of a large group of people that are trying to open up access to scholarly literature, to research data, to all sorts of earlier stage information, it's an attempt to reflect that epistemology. It says if the data is going to be cheap and we're going to be basing our decisions on it, if we're going to be justifying it, opening it up reflects that because it gives us a chance to try to validate whether or not the decisions we made were good or not. And then a lot of what you do here is, is really reflective of that. It's an attempt to reanalyze things and figure out if the choices we made were accurate, if they were justified. So whenever I talk about opening this stuff up, it's not an abstract goal that I have, because I think open is good. Right? Although I do believe that. That's not the reason I do what I do. Right? The reason I do what I do is I think that if we're going to be making policy decisions, regulatory decisions, based on cheap data, we need to have that data be accessible enough that it can be reanalyzed for new discoveries, and that it can be analyzed to figure out whether or not we made the right decisions or not. And openness is coming, right? We are actually all going to have to share if we take federal money. And I'm going to stick with the US because I know the US best, but there are similar movements to the ones I'm going to show you in the EU, in Australia, right, in South America. It's coming wherever research is funded. In the US, we now have an executive order from the Obama administration right, mandating that all government information be made open and machine readable. I saw some semantic notes in the, in the agenda here today. Right, so what they mean by open is it's got to be on the web. It can't have some sort of aggressive license on it. And by machine readable, they mean it's got to be an RDF and it's got to have some form of annotation to it. Right, so this is going to be all US government held information, all the stuff coming out of the federal agencies is going to have to be open and machine readable. And the implementation plans are just starting to roll in. And you would not believe how pissed off everybody is. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's you know, like the Department of Agriculture is like, we have to do what? And, and all of the farm data is going to be open and machine readable. Right? All of the energy data is going to be open and machine readable. Now, this is just data held by the government. It's not data that comes out of the government's investment in research. Right? It's things like this that are driving the investment in research. So this is the NIH policy first promulgated in 07, updated in 09. It says if we give you money for sequence and related genomic studies, that those data also have to be available in dbGaP, which is the database of genotypes and phenotypes run by the NCBI. And these mandates, right, I could have shown you 10 more. They're, they're, they're happening sort of at all different levels of government in the United States and in the EU. And now you're starting to see things like global alliances emerge for sharing data. So this is an, a group that's being led by the Whitehead uh, in Boston that wants to standardize the way that clinical facilities gather genomic data, analyze it, and return the results back to clinicians and to patients. Because frankly, the hospitals aren't ready for the technologies that they can now afford. 
Right? For those cheap sequencing technologies, the clinicians are staring those in the face like a gun. Right? <coughs> clinicians get 15 minutes to interact with you, and it's already complicated enough. If they have to explain your genome to you, it's going to overwhelm things. So all of these changes are happening, and they're happening in a context in which the policy environment says you're going to have to share if you take funding. And the patients, the individuals, are starting to demand to be more of a part of the process. Right, so we're going to have to share. Right? At some level, the data is going to be more open, or it's going to be recreated in a different environment, because it's cheap. Um, two things that I would point out that are related to SAGE that might have an interest here. One is actually being driven out of Toronto here, and it's got the awful name Arch to POCM. But the idea is that early stage clinical studies in rare cancers should happen completely in the public domain. All of the raw data of the clinical studies should sit in the public domain until you get past the proof of concept stage, so phase 2A, phase 2B. And there are actually five different areas that have been identified. I believe it's 10 compounds um, that are going to go forward in this manner. So all of that raw data will be available. You will not have to look into the papers. Right? You'll be able to actually get the files. And second is an idea that says, uh, well, you know, when you do a clinical study, you don't want to release the information because you're worried about getting sued or because you're worried about intellectual property. But what about the data you gathered on the comparator arm? Right, that's your competitor's drug, not yours, or it's just the existing standard of care of the disease progression. Either way, you have no liability and you have no intellectual property implications if you make the comparator arm data available. Right, we've talked to a lot of companies. We've talked to the FDA. Everyone agrees it's a great idea. Uh, unfortunately, it appears to be one of those cases where everyone wants to be fourth and no one wants to be first. Uh, but the continuing implosion of the pharmaceutical discovery process, I'm pretty confident that this is going to happen within the next five years. It's just too easy. The FDA in the U.S. already has all the comparator arm data in machine-readable formats. It would take them less than 30 days once the pharma has ordered them to make it available to flip the switch. All the data is simply held as a trade secret. Right. And so the good news is these things are starting to happen. And there are even conversations about, should we be buying stock in pharmaceutical companies so that we can attend shareholder meetings and ask questions about why it is that comparator arm data isn't being released? Right. These are things that are being talked about in open meetings by serious people who have far more training than I do, which should hopefully give you some hope that you won't have to continue analyzing just stuff out of documents, converting it to data, uh, and then republishing as documents. At some point, this is going to start to be fueled by the actual raw, unpublished data that feeds the clinical studies. And the reason why we're doing this, right, for the most part, is, is a belief, right, a philosophical belief that open systems are able to generate more value over time than closed systems. Closed systems may, be, may be able to generate more value in the short term because you can control them. You can control the transaction cost, you can control the interfaces, but over the long term, right, the systems that have really changed you know, the course of the world over the last 40 years, the technology systems, are these generative systems. And this is Jonathan Zittrain, I worked for him a long time ago, uh, and he's written this beautiful book called The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. And what he's analyzed is this, is this capacity that he calls generative systems. And it's systems that have this ability to create unanticipated change from unanticipated people in unanticipated ways. And that's in many ways the whole point of getting the clinical data open that we're working on, or getting different ways to collect clinical data. It's the belief that it can be reanalyzed by people who weren't the original creators to create value. It's the belief that there are smart people outside the traditional enterprise who are simply barred because of transaction costs or because they don't have the right IRB permissions or because they don't have the right credentials. They're barred from accessing and doing interesting things. And that's not how it works in tech. Right? In tech, any bozo can start a company. Right? I did. Right? I didn't know what I was doing. The transaction costs are so low that you can basically fail very cheaply. And that means that even if your chances of success are not significantly higher than they were, right, the law of averages and sample sizes means you're going to have more successes. And so part of this is saying if we can get the data open and we can build better maps of how the liver works, or if we can build better maps of toxicity, right, then the costs of trying to find drugs are going to fail. And our, even if our accuracy doesn't go up, and I feel like it has to, but even if it doesn't, it'll be cheaper and we'll have more attempts. 
So that's the thesis behind this. And so the goal is then to say, how would we measure whether or not something is generative? It's not like measuring the net present value of a data set. Right? How do you measure the ability of something to create unanticipated change? It's actually really kind of hard. And so Zittrain proposes these four axes of, well, if it's accessible, right, that's a precondition. If you can't see the data or access the data, then you can't use it in an unanticipated way. Right? Second is, can you adapt it? Can you change it? Can you do something to it? Can you remix it? Right? Third, can you leverage it? Can you actually use it in a way that it wasn't intended to be used, as opposed to simply changing it? Right? So accessibility is, can you find it, discover it, download it? Right? Adaptability, can you actually remix it? Third, is the remix useful, which is leverage? And then fourth, which is actually sometimes hardest, is ease of mastery. And so this is a little different in consumer technology, which he was writing in, which is how easy is it for an average person to pick up the technology and use it? So an iPhone is an example of something that's really easy to pick up and use, right? My two-year-old can pick up my iPhone, or my wife's iPhone, my Android now, which has copied the iPhone interface, and figure out how to play a game on it. But some interesting things when you start to, to look at data in this framework, so I'm going to run through an example. Um, so the first is that accessibility correlates very strongly to adaptability. Right? If you cannot find and access the data set and download it, it's very unlikely that you'll be able to do something with the data set. Right? And that's fairly obvious when you, when you state it, but you don't really figure it out until you start trying to, to, to actually quantify this stuff. Adaptability correlates to leverage. You can't use something in, in an unanticipated way unless you can modify it unless you can connect it. If we're talking in a data sense, if you cannot connect a data set to a different data set through standard URIs, common ontologies, it's very hard to leverage that data set in a way that it wasn't intended to be used. And the weirdest thing is that in many times, um, these are almost unconnected to ease of mastery. And you get a fork when you go to ease of mastery. There's the ease of mastery of people who are actually savvy about data, and then there's the ease of mastery of people who are normal human beings. And the designers that are working on these things right now, for the most part, are getting paid to work on systems that are easy for average consumers. And that's why data as we experience it exists in apps on phones and is closed. Because the focus is not on creating something that is generative, it's focused on creating something that's easy to use. So focus on ease of mastery right, tends to actually disable, in many cases, the other three axes of value. And so this is sort of the challenge, is that when you look at where the investment is going, both the venture investment and the government investment, it's going towards things that make data easy to use for average people. Things like putting your data into Google Earth if you're doing GIS-based systems. Well, that might be neat, but if I can't download the damn Excel file and cross-reference it to something else, then the fact that I can zoom around and fly in 3D is basically useless in terms of creating new value. And this is something that's happening in health. If you look at where it's going, it's all, oh, here, put this cool app on your smartphone, right? And it'll help you track your sleep or your fitness right? or your food or your weight. But they don't let you download your own data for the most part. And if they do let you down your, download your own data, it's almost never documented. So you don't know what any of these points mean in the CSV file that you get. And so there's this tension right, between making something easy to use from a data perspective for a consumer, which trends towards apps and making it easy to reuse by people who want to do new studies like you do. And unfortunately, the investment on the private side tends to win. So how could we as scientists actually systematically increase the value on this level of a data set? Right? So this is something we did at SAGE. Right? SAGE is a nonprofit organization, uh, SAGE Bionetworks. We spun out of Merck in 2009. We were basically the large-scale, genome-wide uh, association analytics group inside Merck, originally called Rosetta Informatics, sold in 2001 to Merck. And we went to them and said, and I was part of the group that helped design it. I wasn't at Merck at the time. I was one of the board members. Uh, so we think we could do, for 300 to $500 million, we could generate enough genomic information and health outcomes that we could systematically increase the possibility of, of getting drugs through that hit the population correctly. Merck said, okay, how many years of competitive advantage do we get for $500 million? We said four or five years. And they said, no, thank you. You can take it and make a nonprofit out of it. All right, so, but that's what we do, is that we want to bring large numbers of people, get genetic variation, <coughs> omics data, 
clinical outcomes and build uh, Bayesian statistical models, other kinds of statistical models to stratify those populations and build classifiers. Right? That's what we do. And we want to do that in a way that lets people who work outside SAGE do that as well. All right, we have very good staff, but we're nowhere near as smart as the rest of the world. So what we've been doing is building platforms that let us bring in data and begin doing analysis with people who work outside the organization. So this is the Cancer Genome Atlas. It's a beautiful data project funded by the US NIH trying to build um, an atlas of the genomes of individual types of cancer. Uh, as you see, you can download the data. You can choose from multiple ways. There's multiple different kinds of data. Um, we have to be careful about privacy with this because you can actually resolve individual identity inside these kinds of databases. There's enough fingerprint points in any sort of genomic analysis to do that. So what you see is we've got three ways to download the data from the native TCGA portal. We can, we can do HTTP download, we can do bulk download, or we can do file-based download. There are privacy restrictions. You have to get a clearance to access the controlled element. Um, and there is quite good metadata. So we would put this, you know, generally speaking, this is a relatively accessible, given the realities of the privacy constraints. It's a very adaptable data set because you can download it. It's in a good format and it's well documented. Uh, and it's got high potential leverage, right, because we might be able to learn something about one cancer from a different cancer or about arthritis from doing a meta-analysis of all of the cancers because inflammation and cancer are so related. But all we can really do from the site itself is download the file. And that's not how we actually use data in a modern context. And if we wanted to ask a question, like, are there individual patients that have both tumor and normal samples amidst a group of cell files, we can't ask that. So let's say I went in and I got tested for prostate cancer, but I also gave samples that were normal samples for lung and for blood. Right, this is not an unusual thing in terms of the way some of these samples are collected. If you wanted to do that, right, you've got to actually crawl the entire TCGA, scrape it, download it, map it to a common ontology of phenotypes which we had to build internally, and then you can ask that question. Now the hard part is, how would you ask that question? Most statisticians would ask it from inside a programmatic client. They wouldn't actually browse the data visually. They would use an R client or a Python client. So we had to write R clients and Python clients that let you programmatically issue these kinds of queries. And so what we think we've done, right, as a nonprofit is made that data set more generative. We've radically increased the leverage because of the programmatic clients and the mapping to the standard ontology. Right? We've moderately increased the adaptability and the accessibility simply by mirroring it in another location. We can't do much more on adaptability and accessibility because we can't change the privacy constraints and we don't want to radically change the metadata available other than standardizing it. But by putting it into this environment where it can be queried in a native statistical form, we think we've made it significantly higher leverage. But we haven't had any change on the ease of mastery side, right? Making something accessible through an R client doesn't make it accessible to me, right? I'm a policy guy, it doesn't make it accessible to my mom. But this is a way that we can demonstrate, perhaps economically, in an argument to policymakers that by making the TCGA data open, it allowed for someone who was not the government to come in and make that data more economically valuable, more scientifically useful. So another thing to think about is that the, the TCGA is the sort of data that was generated in a classic sense, right? The government put up hundreds of millions of dollars. It gave it to authenticated individuals at centralized institutions to make a centralized data product. That's going to be hit in the face with the ability of citizens to gather their own data. So just a few clicks. This is Blue Button. This is the U.S. government's standard uh, format for transmitting electronic medical information. It was developed because of the influx of veterans over the last 10 years in our military policies. Uh, but as of now, right, there's what, I think 37 million uh, Americans as of yesterday received access to the last three years of their medical data uh, from Medicare under this format. And it's rolling out to all the major insurance companies in the United States over the next year. And that means you're going to have high quality lab data that's inside medical records that you could extract programmatically. Built into this is the authority to order your record holder to transfer the data on your behalf to a third party whether it's to have it held in a locker or to have research done on it, they're going to have to say yes. This is one of many gizmos being built in Silicon Valley that turns smartphones into medical devices. This one turns it into an ECG. Uh, just using the phone camera, we can do blood pressure and heart rate right, from, the, from your eye blood vessels. 
Uh, using the altimeter, we can tell whether or not you're walking stably or whether you're falling. Using the voice, we can tell whether or not your Parkinson's is progressing faster or slower from the tremor, from the quaver. We can tell whether or not your neurodegeneration is going faster or slower by, whether you can, by the speed at which you can solve the touch tests, right? These things are becoming very sensitive clinical devices. And this is my favorite example of things that didn't used to be data. I have a friend who was studying alcoholism uh, on college campuses, and he got frustrated going through an IRB to put out a survey. And he th thought about, well, if I friended 4,000 people at my university on Facebook, um, I'm pretty sure that no one is using red solo cups who's not drinking alcohol. <laughs> and it's a really easy image mining hack to look for this very specific red of the red solo cup at an American university. And if you think about what time of day was that posted? Was that picture posted after midnight on a Tuesday? Right? We're able to infer health information from cultural artifacts. Right? So there's data everywhere now. And it's increasingly happening that this data is being integrated by startups, right? not by the research system. And I'm not arguing this is a good thing. I think the research system needs to find a way to integrate with this. Because if you look at what happened when computer science and consumer computer technology diverge, it hasn't been good for computer science. It's been good for gizmos and devices. Right? But we have these crappy legacy systems sitting underneath those gizmos and devices that are radically insecure and inefficient. Because some of the most basic lessons of computer science have been lost. And if we keep going this way in health, that's what we're going to find. So I want, I'm, I'm not arguing this to say that we need to get rid of the research enterprise, although some do. I want to find a way to bring them together. And if you want to actually integrate this, for the most part, it sucks, right? So I'll give you an example from my life. Uh, this is my 23andMe genome profile. I've had my exome done, but I only, I'm only doing this with my genotype right now. So I have an elevated risk of prostate, psoriasis, and uh, Alzheimer's disease. No one can tell me what to do. No doctor has ever been able to tell me what to do other than to eat less and exercise. So I thought, okay, I'm going to share it. So I'll, going through a consent system, I'll show you in a second. I posted it on the Sage Synapse Compute platform. As soon as it got posted, it got syndicated to the OpenSNP wiki, uh, which is a wiki of now uh, almost 1,000 genotypes um, run out of Germany. If you get onto the OpenSNP wiki, you get harvested onto a separate thing called SNPpedia, which does algorithmic health assessments based on your genotypic profile. And so I just got this email saying, hey, your health report's ready. Um, and so you get these very different results than 23andMe, right? So 23 showed prostate, Alzheimer's, psoriasis is my top three. This shows hypertension, but the repute is bad. So uh, thankfully, I know what that means. I know that that means I shouldn't trust the result. But if I'm an average user, I've shown this to a few people and said, well, do you think that that means that the result is bad or that the authority of the result is bad? And most of them couldn't answer the question. Uh, the other one is, is of good repute, which is that I won't go bald, which I'm psyched about. And then uh, from Snippedia, it got syndicated to a genetic genealogist in the UK who unsolicited sent me back my allele program report in an email. Oh, I'm missing the last sentence. The, the email he sent me said that um, there was no suggestion of consanguinity in my pedigree. <laughs> right. So imagine receiving this kind of email blind. And I'm from the South in the United States. There's lots of jokes about inbreeding, right? This could have gone really badly. I mean, think about every step I just showed you, how badly it could have gone, right? If I didn't know what I was doing and I get sent back, you have a lethal allele, right? Your parents are cousins, right? This is not the sort of generative, positive, good thing that I'm talking about. And this is unfortunately the reality if you try to share your data. Now, the good news is, is that if you can combine the sort of citizen power data that I just showed you with the sort of... Um, increase in generativity that we did to TCGA, that we can actually make interesting things happen. But what's missing in all of these equations is a community that can do the analysis. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to be here today was that this is one of the communities that does reanalysis of data, one of the only communities that does that kind of reanalysis of data. And it's proven that these collaborations are possible. You guys are an existence proof. It's also proven that we can run these on the raw data. So this is what you'd see if you're on the Sage homepage. Um, a big part of what we do is run challenges to reanalyze data. So we took a bunch of data in breast cancer, um, the Metabric and the Oslo Val data sets from, from Europe. 
uh, and we generated with help from the Avon Foundation uh, novel data on 200 women. And the idea was, we know whether or not women who had breast cancer got a certain kind of treatment, uh, whether they relapsed or not, because we've got 10 years of longitudinal data on them. Can we provide that data but obscure whether or not the relapse happened and have a community of data scientists outside of SAGE compete to classify, right, based on genetic variation and other processes, the likelihood that any given woman in the study would have relapsed or not. And we had more than a million mathematical models submitted from more than 150 teams in over 50 countries, and the only reward was lead authorship in a Nature Translational Medicine article, sorry, Science Translational Medicine article. If you won the contest, you didn't have to go through peer review. And the winning team was a group of electrical engineers, not biologists, who had been ignored by the biologists and cancer teams at the university where they worked. Right? Because they were able to run network-driven analysis models that found a group of attractor genes that more accurately predicted whether or not relapse happened or not than the biological theory did. Now, they can't explain biologically why, but now we have a heuristic that is 77% accurate on a sample size as small as 500 women. So what we're going to do now is blow that up and try to do 10,000 women and see if we can get that number up into the 90s. Um, and we didn't just get them a, uh, a lead authorship, we actually got the cover as a result of this project. And I would like to invite Cochrane, right, if there's any way that we can work together at SAGE with you, right, as these clinical studies become available in a raw form. Right? as other kinds of data become available in a raw form. If we can host those, make them more generative, and host these sorts of challenges, we would love to talk to you. Right? Because we're basically the intermediary. We're the platform on which the analysis happens. We're not the, we're not the community that does it. And we'd love to recruit you if we can. Um, these are the challenges that we're running right now. So we're doing uh, the Extended Breast Cancer Network Inference Challenge, some toxicogenetics, brain cancer, some basic research stuff and whole cell parameter estimation. Um, you'll see a, a whole new batch of challenges launching next month um, in sleep, Parkinson's, diabetes, and other areas. It does mean that we have to have new ways to govern if we're going to engage the citizens. Uh, this is what we have to show users on our platform if they're going to access you know, green, yellow, red data, depending on whether it's de-identified, um, moderately identified, or really controlled or sensitive populations. So we actually have to have web-based ways to educate those people who show up, the electrical engineers who've never worked with human subjects data. Um, and we have to have consent structures to populate when the citizens come in with their red cups. Um, so we actually have a complete online consent system that lets people donate their data to science if they've got it, if they've got their genotype in these other systems. Um, it's very basic. You just go through it as a wizard and you click your way through. If you click on a term in blue, it pops up definitions. And so we say to the users, you can't re-identify people even if you can. You promise you won't. Right? Even if you can hurt them, you agree not to. And you'll make your research available under open access so it can be reanalyzed after you've published it. Um, the citizen has to grant four rights. They don't get to choose. They have to grant all four of them. They grant the right to do research, the right to redistribute, the right to publish the results, and the right to commercialize the results that come out of it. They have to watch a video. It's seven minutes long, but we lose 80 to 90 percent of the participants during those seven minutes. It's stunning. Um, it's, a, it's YouTube, you know. Uh, you, have to, you have to click on these three risks to say that you understand them. Right? I understand the risks and uncertainties, I provide consent, and I understand that even if I want to withdraw, we'll take down your data. Uh, but there's no guarantee if we've distributed your data that we can get it back. That's the reality of data in the world. And only then can you sign the consent form. Uh, what's interesting is you know, we've already had 1,500 you know, normal quote-unquote people show up. More than two-thirds of them have already donated at least one data file. Um, and they turn out to be fairly well informed. Um, so, as you see, uh, about two-thirds of them say they read at least most of the consent form itself. The reason we did all of this wizard stuff is that no one reads consent forms, and no one knows what they're signing up for. So, uh, at least, you know, and we think there's probably a positive bias here, but supposedly 65% of our participants actually read most of the consent form or more. But then we see, do they understand it? So we have 100% accuracy on choosing what data to upload, 98% accuracy on whether or not it's up to you to decide to withdraw. And uh, if you withdraw it's certain your data can be cleared, we got 92.4% accuracy that the answer there is no. Guaranteed confidentiality, we only got 58.5% understanding that they are not guaranteed confidentiality, that we'll do our best. 
but that no one can really guarantee confidentiality if you're talking about a genome. Right, that the more data you upload about yourself, the more valuable your individual data set becomes, but it also means the more identifiable your data set becomes. There's this inherent tension between privacy and anonymity in health research, because it's what makes you unique that makes you unique. And so we try to be honest about that. So we're actually fixing that one in the next rev. Uh, and then, you know, that your data be redistributed, they have to sign terms of use. So we're actually really happy. Our, our comprehension is much higher than an average consent form. Uh, we also have a system that allows a researcher, if they find an interesting patient, to send a, uh, a basically a, a remailer back to that patient without knowing who that patient is or what their email address is. Uh, they can send an email to the unique identifier for that patient, contact them asking for new data or to re-enroll them in a novel kind of study. Um, and we're doing this now with four different kinds of data. So we, we, we started with the sequence and the omics data and the clinical information. We're now expanding that out to include all sorts of lifestyle sensor data and what have you. Um, so the Parkinson study I mentioned with, with, uh, with the voice tremor data, we're going to be running that uh, under a grant from DARPA. Uh, and we're going to be doing uh, a sleep study using sleep sensors that run off of the mobile phones as well. So the, the, the last bit, and this is where I'll end, is, is that, that if there's no guarantee that cheap data makes this work. Right? I've painted, a, I hope, a moderately optimistic picture. Um, my sense is that if we don't recruit groups like you to come look at this data, if we don't make open systems the core and the default, that it's actually going to get worse. Right? It's going to get more expensive and our decisions are going to get worse. And so just a quick example is melanoma. So there's a variety of apps in the Apple Store and the Android Store that say, if you take a picture of a skin tag, we'll tell you whether or not you should go get a biopsy. Right? And I, I've chosen one, but I think there, there were seven the last time that I looked. Now let's run the math on the cost of false positives. Now I'm being charitable here, right? We've, we've done some back of the envelope analysis. As far as we can tell, the false positive rate for these melanoma apps is over 90%. The app developer has no incentive to tell you not to get a biopsy. The doctor has no incentive not to run the biopsy. They get paid $1,000 either way. But at a 90% false positive rate, right, if we have a million downloads, we're looking at a $900 million false positive cost because of cheap data. And it'll make no decisions better. None of that data will get fed back. We'll have no idea how to actually improve any of those apps. So it's important. Right? It's not important, just important to advance science or to, or to justify the epistemology. Right? It's actually economically vital that we understand why we're making the decisions that we're making. Thanks.